This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, Episode 37, recorded February 16th, 2012. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommier. Hello Vincent. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Bonjour. Como se va? What is it in Portuguese? Bon dia? I don't know. I forgot. That's a New Zealand thing, it's a bon dia chord. What's it in Japanese? Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. How are you today, Good American. To Good American. You forgot German. Guten Morgen. How are you today? I'm chipper. I've heard that one before. <laughs> no, I feel, yeah, when you watch the movie Fargo. This morning there was a wonderful pink sunrise. Now it's all cloudy. <sighs> we're going to get a little rain today, I think, Vince. I it's think fine. That's what's going to happen. There's a weird winter we're having here. It's in, bizarre. In you know, there's, there's a flower tour of the Bronx Botanical oh, Garden. Not more orchids. Now. No, no. Outdoor, <laughs> flat, outdoor plants that have bloomed. And the amazing thing was that bees actually went to the flowers. Now, Where do they come from? Bees are supposed to be asleep at this time of the year. They sleep at the wheel, eh? So they must detect the odor. And it wakes them up? And that must wake them up because they... They wouldn't be out scouring. Where the, are they sleeping? In hives? Yeah, in hives, of course. Nursing their hmm. annual supply of honey. Animals so that, other than humans have very heightened senses. They do. The other day I saw two hawks, very large hawks, sitting on trees behind my home. Yes. So I got my camera. All right. I went outside and I hid so they couldn't see me and I snapped a few photos. And then I stepped into their view. They were 100 yards away. Right. I just slowly, as soon as I came around the corner, boom, they were gone. Right. They saw me immediately. Oh, yeah. What eyes. Oh, yeah. Hmm. They were red-tailed because when they flew away, I could see the red. They're very common in this area. They they were about a foot and a half high. And they're running. Two of them. Were they a pair, you think? Yeah, absolutely. Huh. It was pretty cool. This is the time when they start migrating back north. Do they have parasites? Of course they do. What have. sorts? Um, mostly filarial parasites. No, okay. And it, In doesn't, fact, har- it doesn't harm them? We're gonna be, I didn't say that. No, I'm asking. I don't know the answer, but I, th- I think any parasite... You get parasite- defensive when you don't know something. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> I never get defensive. I get defensive a lot. <laughs> yeah, I know. You guys don't know, you <laughs> listeners, uh, how I curse every morning at Dixon. No, he's not cursing at me. He's just cursing at the wind. He's just he's doing a generic, generic uh, uh, expurgation of his soul before he starts his wonderful day. You have a striped blue shirt. That's what I wore yesterday. Well, that's my uh, uh, uniform of the day. I think yesterday you were on Australian television. It was. And this today I shall be on British television. Wow. We're, we're monopolizing the media. <laughs> so let me tell the listeners the story of why we're doing what we're doing today. Good idea. Yesterday, Dixon finished writing a, the final chapter of a book he's been working on about parasites, right? That's correct. And it concerned this... Um, parasite that we will talk about today and i yes. said have we ever talked about this on twip and he said no and i said why not he said well let's do it well no i said because it's of such low medical importance today because it's almost eradicated that's <clears throat> but at one time it wasn't of low medical importance no, that's in fact, right in your book the <laughs> yes. bible of parasites it says here at one point there were 10 million i'm sorry in 1986, three and a half million cases in 20 countries. Right. At that time, the World Health Assembly it called for eradication. You know, that was two years before they called for polio eradication. Is that right? And at the moment, how many cases do we have globally? About 10,000. Spread over which continents? Mostly Africa. Mostly Africa. But also elsewhere? In India. There's some in India. There used to be some in Bangladesh. I believe that's mm-hmm. all gone now. Uh, it's easy to control, as we will see, uh, when we get to the uh, story. Of- so it's an interesting parasite. I talked Dixon <coughs> into doing an episode, so we're returning to basic parasitism. Right. And, you know, we could do some others. I think we should. I will we talk could. you into some others. No, we could. We, could do- we haven't done Trichomonas, for instance. Yeah, and Neglaria. We did Neglaria. 
We when, did? Yeah, we talked about it when we talked about uh, the amoebae. These are the ones that go into your brain? Yeah, or you could. S- you swim and they get in your brain. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. All right, so th- we haven't said the name in the classification of today's no. parasite no. yet. Should we just end the show now? I if, well, Let's ask them for questions. Maybe one of them will ask what the name of the parasite is, and we can tell them. <laughs> well, let's give us some clues. We've already said it's almost eradicated. Yeah. And I know what it is by That's that alone because and it's a waterborne I'm into infection. eradication. Yeah, you are. And, and yours is a waterborne infection also. Isn't that interesting? I don't know if polio is waterborne. I, I would it's call fecal it fecal contamination. Yeah, but it's fecal okay, contamination of water. Okay, you can get water supply, sure. Got it. <clears throat> okay. But mine is not filterable. Oh, mine is. Mine passes In through fact, the filter. In fact... Mm-hmm. That's the nugget of our story, Vince. Vincent's all excited. You can see it. Yeah, yeah. Mine is a filterable agent. That is. <laughs> because you can filter it. Can you see it with the naked eye? Uh, the adult, of course. All right. Now, in your book, it's in the, it's in the classification of nematodes. That's right. Correct? Correct. <clears throat> what was the last nematode we talked about? Mm. Yeah, we'd have to look it up. I would guess the last one we talked about was a filarial parasite. Like Oncocerca? Wo- uh, either that or Wuchereria. Okay. So this Wuchereria. is in the same group. It's, it is? It is. We're going to talk about another filarial parasite. Okay. Which one is it? And it's not the one that everyone likes because they can remember its name. Loa Loa. It's you not Loa Loa. think everyone remembers Loa Loa? Once they're told what it is, they can easily remember Why didn't it. we do Loa Loa? Because it's of minor medical importance? Probably. Would it not uh, illustrate any aspect of parasitism that would be educationally useful? It could. So we can do that in some time as well. Right. But this one in particular is a poster child for something. I think we should put all the basic parasitism twips in, on a CD and distribute <laughs> it. If people would like one, we can do that. Sure. They get it off the internet, I guess. They can get it off the internet. But not all at once. This is true. Not all at once. It's hard. <coughs> At any right. rate, just so a it's passing a, it's thought. It's a nematode. It's a nematode. That's right. It is um, worm-like. It's a, it's a filarial nematode. Remind us, a, a nematodes are roundworms? Yes, not segmented. Yes. They have a nervous system. They like have a, earthworms. That's right. Is an earthworm a nematode? No. Why did you say that's right, then? I said it's, it's, it's a worm, but it's, you said it's segmented. What's the relationship between an earthworm and nematodes? They're both roundworms, Vince. But they're in different... Different phyla. Phyla. Yeah. Kingdom phylum. Yeah. What is the phylum of uh, nematodes? And nematelmenthes. Oh. And the wor- earthworms are anelida? Oligochetes. Oligochetes. Wow. Should we tell them what we're talking about? Sure. Go ahead. Well, the name of this worm is you may have been able to guess by the fact that there are so few now, but there were lots before is a worm called Dracunculus medinensis. Dracunculus medinensis. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Why is it it called Dracunculus? Dracunculus relates to an old term, Draco, or dragon-like. Draco? Yeah, Draco, D-R-A-C-O. In fact... Draco Malfoy? Well, don't laugh. Does it mean dragon? That means dragon. So so from... uh, from those mythical books uh, about Harry Potter, you can take this back, and, and I, went, I want to give you an anecdote here, to which was quite <laughs> defining for my life, at least as a teacher. I was probably here for 10 years when this happened. One of our medical students who had a theatrical background and had come into the class late in his life back in the in those days. He was maybe in his late twenties, early thirties. And in order to play a joke on me, because he really liked me and I really liked him. Bad taste. <clears throat> probably in both directions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he gleamed glommed sorry, Gloned. glommed. Glommed. He glommed onto you. An extra copy of the final exam, Vince. How did he do that? And he f- I don't know, because we counted every one of them. Wow. And we gave them out, but he got an extra copy. And he filled it out, and he put all kinds of crazy answers on it. Mm-hmm. And he signed it, Draco Volans. V-O-L-A-N-S? Yeah. That was his name? That's what he said it was. But that wasn't really his name. Of course not. Hmm. So I... I you know, of course, I went to the, went to the student, uh, the, the dean of students. In that, those days, it was Linda Lewis, and I said... Uh, Dr. Lewis, somebody has failed my exam, but I can't find their name on my class list. 
<laughs> Their name is Draco Volens. And, of course, she was stymied as well, and she started to look through the class roster. Maybe there was a late edition or something, and no one could find the name, of course, because there was no student by that name. This guy, whose name I have since forgotten, thank mm -hmm. goodness, <clears throat> and who did very well on the exam, filled this out and just wanted to um, make reference to the nematodes that are, some of them have this name, and a draconculus, Draco, is the dragon. Why is it called dragon? Good idea. I, you know, it's not an idea. Good question. No, no, no. It's a good idea for a question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's right. it's probably called dragon because it's it's long, and and I think I do know the answer to it. Yeah, but we'll get to it I later. Gave it to you on a platter. To we're we're going to get to this later on <laughs> okay. because it's also known as the fiery serpent of the Israelites. Oh. So that's another name for this parasite. And why would that ever be? And that's some of the story that we're going to unfold about this parasite revolves around the mythology of the origin of the caduceus. Caduceus. What's the a caduceus? caduceus? Is that well, a serpent of some, uh, some kind? Some people in our listening audience, I am certain, smiled when you said, what's a caduceus? Because they are physicians and they're practicing physicians. How do you spell it? And they're nurses. C A D U E. <laughs> Do you want me to look it up? Caduceus, C E U S. Caduceus. 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 C A D U C E U S. That's how you'd spell Caduceus. it. Caduceus. Here, I just wrote a chapter on that yesterday, and I still get stuck on the spelling because it's not phonetically spelled the way it uh, sounds. So, um, the caduceus is worn as a symbol of healing by physicians, and what is it? It's a, it's a, uh, it, a staff. You'd call it a staff, but other people have called it a sword because they've depicted it as a sword with handle mm -hmm. and a, a, a shaft of the, the blade of the sword, and around which are wound two intertwined snakes. Oh, look at that! Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. There's here. a whole bunch of them. And every every even the New York Sanitation Department has a caduceus on their trucks. You should so look. Every physician here has one on their coat. Well, they not all. They could. I mean, that's the symbol for the American Medical Association. Yeah, the caduceus. Yeah. But it also some version of the caduceus is used by nurses, or used by nurse practitioners, right. physical therapists. Uh, in fact, if you go to the World Health Organization and look them up, you will see <clears throat> that the caduceus uh, forms the basis for their symbol. But it's not the yeah. same caduceus. Just, it was originally Mercury's. Symbol right? Hermes, Hermes, yeah, Hermes. But we'll we'll talk about this a minute because I think Hermes. The, sorry, the origin. That's right. Mercury is the Roman. Roman version of Hermes. So, so where the heck does the caduceus come from? Where does the symbol for it come from? And what does it mean? So I had to do a little research on this, and it was actually quite interesting because the answer to that question is nobody knows, but they can t trace it back in antiquity to before Hermes, mm -hmm. all right? They're back in the old Babylonian times now, and in fact, they have found a version of it on a piece of Syrian pottery dating back to the days of Babylonia. Okay. So that's quite far back in, in history, but it's still written history because cuneiform writing was in vogue in those days, right. okay? Right. But if you go to uh, India or China, you can find a version of a stick and a snake-like object further back in history than, than even that. But the dating is uh, kind of muddied up, so nobody really knows how far back it goes. How did it become associated with this well, that's, nematode? Well, that's the whole story, Vince. Oh. That's what we're going to talk okay. about. <clears throat> because it is a story, and uh, it's an interesting one, because let's, let's begin with just the worm. And, yes, uh, and what is it, yes. and where does it live, and how does it affect us, and how do we get is rid it, of it? Is it living? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just like Martha Stewart. Are there viruses that infect it? <laughs> That's a great question. I bet I, there are. Of course, because it's a living entity. It's a successful life form. It's a parasite. It's a parasite. So there are parasites of parasites of parasites. All right, so it's a worm. It is a nematode. It is. And, and uh, it lives. Should we do a life cycle? We, no. Tell me where it lives. Okay. To begin with, it lives in the subcutaneous tissues of the extremities. For uh, the most part. What, people? People. Any animals? <sighs> the, 
There are two. Am, um, I, am I making it difficult by asking you questions? You're not making it difficult Such at all. Such a sigh. I have to give you a difficult answer. <laughs> are there animal hosts? The answer is yes and no. Depends but this on one, you, the Dracunculus medinensis. It depends on who you ask. Uh, well, I'm asking you, Dr. De Pommier. Well, I'm not the ultimate expert on this parasite. Who I'm is? Merely the spokesperson. Uh, if you look up the nematode uh, genome project, you can find several people who have at least done some genomics on Dracunculus metanensis. So your your view is that <coughs> humans are the main host, and there may be... A, They're a, certainly a the main host. host. And and if there oh. were other important reservoir hosts, it would be impossible to, to eradicate. There you go. I was just going to say the fact that you could eradicate it means it's just infecting humans. One would suspect, yeah. therefore, that. And, and we better hurry to find out because in another 10 years from now, there won't be any more Dracunculus metanensis around if there's only one species. But uh, I've seen some other species in the literature. There are many species of Dracunculus, many. One that infects dogs, one infects cats. Different one species. Infects, yeah. Now, it says here in your book, uh, cats... Dogs, monkeys, horses, cattle, raccoons, and foxes have been implicated in the transmission. So this is what you're referring to, that there may be, but we're not sure. No, because we're not sure of the species, you see. We're not directly sure of the species. Yeah. And it's not difficult to tell. I you, see. That's what you say here. Yeah. You just have to get some DNA from each of these adult worms and then compare them and see if they're similar or identical. Uh, can you take a mouse and infect the mouse with Trachunculus metanensis? I don't know that answer. Mm -hmm. How about a ferret? Oh, that's different. Ferrets are people, so therefore we can... <laughs> I just pushed one of Vince's biggest buttons. <laughs> are you a ferret? Some people think... I ferret out information, thank you. <laughs> no, I'm not a ferret. No, ferrets stink. I, I don't like ferrets as pets. They, I know someone who had one, and they, uh, they give off an odor that's uh, very unpleasant. Well, maybe they think you smell. Well, I'm sure they do think I smell, but they don't mind that smell, you see. But we do. <laughs> yeah. So, Dracunculus metanensis, let's just assume for the moment that there's a single species okay. of Dracunculus that infects humans. And the host is the subcutaneous peripheral tissue. Well, that's their site. They and locate people. to the lower extremities. That means legs, right? Yeah. In then why don't you just say legs instead of lower extremities? Well... You think you're a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> because it's... <laughs> Let's start the show again, shall we? <laughs> I'm a doctor, yes, but not a physician. You're not a physician. I'm not a physician. I'm a doctor. Lower that? extremities. Lower extremities. That's the Do way you to say febrile. Also, instead I... of I have a fever, I'm, I'm febrile. <laughs> I have a fever. Fever. <laughs> 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 yeah. There's a problem with doing this first thing in the morning. Yeah, well, You're cranky, Dixon. <laughs> I've had my coffee. I don't know about you, Vince, but I'm having no, my I'm coffee fine, as I'm we fine. speak. <laughs> I'm fine. I had a little traffic this morning. Vince has to travel the from lower the extremities the, of humans, humans, subcutaneous tissues. That's what right. What does subcutaneous mean? Well, it's below the cutaneous. Below the dermis and below the epidermis. Below the dermis. So there's, a der there's an epidermis and a dermis, and then there's a subcutaneous. All right. How does it get there? That's the $64 billion question. How does it get there? And we don't have a clue. Legs. It never goes to your arms. Well, it didn't. I didn't say that. There are some aberrant sites that okay. this worm has located, and like... From out of the middle of your chest, can you imagine something like that happening? Or out of your cheek, for instance, or off from your arm. This thing they can just poke out of these sites? It can locate to all kinds wow. of places, but most commonly, and for the reinforcement of the life cycle, it should locate at a lower extremity in order to succeed. And how big are these worms? How long are they? They can be up to 100 centimeters long. 100 centimeters. That's a, a long... Meter. Worm. And they're about the thickness of a pencil? They're 1.5 centimeters in thickness. Oh, that's pretty. That's bigger than a pencil. Unless you use fat pencils. Yeah. The ones that are sitting on my desk are not one and a half it's centimeters. It's about like this. It's about a pencil size? Okay. Well, it, I would say it's a little less than that based on the pictures that I've seen. But and they just reside in your subcutaneous tissue. So a meter, that would be there. your whole leg, basically. Basically your whole leg. That's exactly right. So what are they doing there, anyway? They, well, before you do that, anatomically, they have a head and a tail. They're nematodes. So they have everything other nematodes have. They have a they mouth. Have, they have a nerve ring, which is their brain. Yeah. They have anterior commissures and posterior commissures. That's a commissure. It's a branch of the nervous system. Okay. Do they have a mouth? Of course. An opening where they take food in. Well. <laughs> Remember the hookworm picture with the, yeah, uh, the it, scary picture? Uh, no. It's got nothing like that. And we're not sure how this worm actually feeds. It could feed directly across from its cuticle. No, I bet it doesn't feed. I bet it has bacteria that provide food for it. <laughs> you mean it. Wolbachia? 
or some other kind of you mean endo, endo, some, symbiont. No, no, no. It, it actually does require nutrition. So we think, we, again, we don't know much about this worm's life. We don't know much about any of these worms' Why is that? Life. Well, let me think about that one for a no minute. No animal model? No, there are some animal models. Of course there are. But who would pay to see the answer? Well, at one time when there were millions of people infected, I would suspect someone would work on it, no? All they wanted to do was get rid of it. So you're telling me there was never an active research community on Dracunculus? Not that I'm aware. So in your career as a parasitologist, you oh, never knew anyone who worked on this worm? Let me tell you why, though, Vince. It takes a whole year for this worm to grow up. Oh, okay. So that's a little bit of an impediment. I wouldn't select that as an animal model if I were you, because you're going to be a long time studying the life cycle of this parasite. Okay. And you're going to have to use something like a monkey that's long-lived rather than a mouse that only lives for a total of about a year and a half anyway. And you're not going to get a, a full meter's length of a worm into a mouse. That's just All not right. going to happen. So uh, this has a lot of drawbacks as to why it wasn't studied. Okay. But again, at the, at the time of its heyday, so to speak, when it was infecting millions of people, it was causing huge amounts of disfiguring disease, but only in the rural communities. So they Disfig were neglected. So the problem is disfiguration. Yes, and, and immobilization of feet, for instance. So that feet? Foot. Yeah, but what's the I thought you said leg. Well, foot. Look at the picture in the book. That's the top of the foot. So, so the this worm, worm goes all the way down to your from foot. From your knee to your foot. And which part is that your foot? The head? The head. Always? Well, if this worm is smart, it would put the head there. So we have to learn how it got there. We do. Because it must be related to that, right? It is, actually. And it's related to So that. the main problem in people is that this disfigures your foot, but it's not going to kill you, is it? No. Unless you die from secondary bacterial infections. Okay. And how long do you have this worm in you? One year? One year. And then what happens to it? Well, then it has to reproduce. So somehow it has to get its uh, offspring to the next host. So its offspring, like all filarial worms, are uh, live larvae that it produces. Okay, the they adult. Have a name. Yeah, the life cycle here. Well, they're just called larvae. Larvae. Okay. Larvae. So this adult is in you for a year, and then at the end of that year, roughly, it needs to release larvae. And it does so in a bizarre way. Okay, unlike all the other filarial parasites. The other filarial parasites, Oncocerca produces microfilariae, mm -hmm. and they crawl in the subcutaneous tissues because that's where the adult of that parasite lives mm -hmm. as well. But mm -hmm. it doesn't migrate anywhere. Once it's deposited at the bite of the black fly, it stays right there, remember? Right. So its microfilariae have to radiate from that site right. so that they have a chance of being picked up when a black fly bites you, no matter where it bites you. <coughs> And Wuchereria bancrofti lives in the it lives in the lymphatic vessels, and so the filarial microfilaria get into the blood eventually through the thoracic mm -hmm. duct, and then they get picked up by the mosquitoes because that's the vector for the Wuchereria. Okay. But there's there's no insect vector for Dracunculus. No insect vector. Okay. None. It's not an insect that's the vector, but there is a vector. Okay. All right. Well, you wouldn't call it a vector. You'd call it an intermediate host. Mm -hmm. Because this doesn't do anything to you. You do something to it. All right. So wait, let's you want to take it from this adult stage? I How do. did the larvae get out? Right. So you said the, it was bizarre. It is bizarre because there's no other parasite in the world that does this. <clears throat> okay. At least not in humans. The secretions from the head of the female gravid dracunculus. You typically just have one worm in you? One. And always a female? Yeah. Well, there had to be two, didn't there? Where'd the male go? That's exactly right. We don't know anything about it. He was probably digested a long Bam. time ago. No, 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 no. I, we'll get to that. All right. We'll get to that. So the female is gravid. It, her head is in your foot. Right. Subcutaneous tissue is close to the surface. Right. All right. And then she begins to secrete something. Which now, up to this point, do you know you have a worm in your leg? Not a clue. Really? Not a clue. Hmm. You might you might somehow Itch. feel this cord like material underneath your skin. You might know it's there, but it doesn't cause any irritation. It doesn't cause any immune response. Mm -hmm. it must be suppressing it, right? It must be suppressing it. Curious. As we'll get to this. So there's a lot of curiosities about this one. So 
the head of the female worm uh, secretes something. We don't know what we don't it is. Don't know what it is. That induces a blister. All right, a blister. But not just a blister, a big blister. Look at how big that blister was. It's like two inches in diameter. It can be that big, but it's usually smaller than that. It's and usually about the size hurt, of a quarter. And because of the pressure that's placed on the tissue below it, mm -hmm. the pain is intense. And there's only one way to relieve the pain, and that's to soak your feet in water. Oh, you could lance it. You could. You could. But people who get this probably don't have access to health care, right? No health care whatsoever. So They're living in the rural. I have a blister on my foot, lance it. That's right. That's okay. right. And but, then if they did lance it, they would see a head of a worm in there, right? That's correct. <coughs> Pardon me. but You're really bothering people by doing that. Well, you can edit that out. Yeah, but that's a lot of work for me. So stop coughing. <laughs> he yells at me all the time, everybody. <laughs> that's okay. I yell back. So... So you're. This so you're, is where if we weren't recording, I would say something, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> It'll take you longer to edit that out. <laughs> That's right. They don't even say that on the car so, talk. So you say the only. Um, Relief is to soak it in water. Yeah, because that's the word you get from the uh, village elders. They say, feels "Oh, good I had I one of those, I put it and in it water. hurts." But then you just go down to the step well. And by the way, as long as you're there, you might as well bring back some water. You go and to the, the step well. What is a step? Yeah, well? what is a step well? Is it something that has a step? Yeah, it just so it's a down humanly into the well. made well. It's a no. It's a naturally made well. It's an it's an artesian well usually. Hmm. Step well. I have to look that up. You know what an artesian well is, Vince? It's a natural upwelling of water, right? The surf that comes to the surface by itself. Surface. You don't have to pump it. Yeah. Okay, so it's where the aquifer meets mm -hmm. the surface of the earth. So when you have one of those oh, the situations, the water can re be reached by a series of descending steps. Correct. So this must be steps are human made, it's right? Very common. Yeah, so ah. it's very common throughout the rural tropics. In India, they have pictures here. Tons also. of them. Okay. And and in fact, there are social meeting places, as we will right, discuss. So where water naturally comes to the surface, an artesian well, they build yes. this step around they it. They build the steps down to the well, because it's more convenient to get to it this way, it's otherwise like, you slide right down into like it. It's like the watering hole. It is the watering hole. So you go hole. to get your water there, yes. and you talk to people while you you're You do, there. because you've just walked a week to get the water. And now you're telling me that they're going to put their feet in the bloody water Absolutely, that you betcha. Do they also wash here? Uh, no, they know enough not to do but that. But they put their feet in. Oh, but of course. Uh, and this does and what, what to the happens? boil? Not to the boil, it's a blister. Blister, sorry. It's all right. Boils are caused by bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are, Vince. <laughs> but you're just not a, an MD. They're, they're, their degree doesn't give them as much knowledge as ours does, by the way. My dad was an MD. No offense, know. by the way. My dad was an MD. I, I, heard, I heard you. I knew more about viruses than he did. He was a surgeon, right? He was a surgeon. He was a thoracic surgeon. Uh -huh. but he, I knew more about viruses, Yes, which is not saying much. He was a really good surgeon. Well, uh, you would have made a good team. If you had a thoracic virus, he could no, have removed it. I didn't it. want to cut people's chests open. <laughs> didn't, didn't, have, didn't see it as my calling. No. No, and look at you. Look what you're doing now. This is fine. I'm talking to you. And to the rest of the world. I have no regrets. None. No, I don't want to be a surgeon. No, of course not. Nor did I, by the way. So, okay, so back to the story. Yes, people will step into these wells. They've just walked it relieves it. three days in the hot sun. Mm -hmm. And they're out they have a big jug on their shoulders, right? And Don't by the way, yeah. it's usually women. Who have these boils, I'm sorry, blister. No, it's usually the women who go for the water. Yeah, that's right. So what are the men doing? <clears throat> I don't know, playing poker, who knows. Mm -hmm. In many societies, they're not working as hard as the women, that's for sure. That's very sad, but that's true. And what about in the U.S.? Uh, it's probably the opposite. In the US. I don't know. We don't have a division of labor like that anymore, but we used to. Okay, so the so, women go. They have, but both men and women get these yeah, of worms, course, of right? Course. Yeah, because because of what happens next, you see. So, let's say the victim. Let's call them the victim. Okay, they've got this blister on their foot. And it's hurting like crazy. And imagine you're walking for three days. Why do you it, have to walk three days to get to the water? Yes. Really. Yes. Yeah. I know. It's tragic. And it's the water is polluted, by the way. From what? Runoff? From your feet. No. 
and from runoff. And the fact is that animals can come down and use that yeah, as well. Yeah. So it's a common source of water for a well, lot of Well, as people are walking, they're picking up <coughs> contamination on their feet. And of course, of course. They walk into the water to scoop out their, <clears throat> their water, and in the meantime, they're getting their feet wet. And the blister breaks <coughs> open. Why does it break open in fresh water? It's a very interesting question, Vince. So the, the um, osmotic pressure... Mm-hmm difference between the inside of the blister and the outside of the blister is remarkably different. Sure. And there must be some protein solution on the inside. And the protein solution on the inside creates this osmotic pressure difference. Is the membrane lining the blister thin? Very thin. I would think these people would poke it with a stick. I think if you do that, something even worse happens. What happens? I don't know. I'm just saying. That <laughs> I know you're not a doctor. <clears throat> I'm not a doctor, but I, but I think that that's not part of this uh, behavior pattern. Okay. So the common behavior is to go put your foot in the water. Put your foot How in long the water. does it take to break the blister? Is it happens almost instantaneous, wow. and it's an instant swelling up, and then it breaks open, releasing the live larvae into the local area of the water. So this is what's amazing to me. This has evolved <laughs> to induce people to put their feet in water. <laughs> I mean, you could imagine that an animal would do the same thing. They have a pain in their foot and they go in water and it feels better. And wow. they, all, they also need to go to water to drink every day. Some animals have to drink water so every day. So the larvae, day. which are not visible to the naked eye, get no, released but the, from... But they're gorgeous. If you take a look, a look at their pictures, they have these big, long, sinuous tails. The larvae? And, and they're very active. They, they, they can move around. Yeah, they, yeah. they, they, they move by uh, coiling and uncoiling. Wow. So now there's a photo in your book here of, um, of someone's foot with the blister broken. Yes. And you can see the white worm in it. It's quite large. That's correct. And this is what has happened after it bursts. That this is, is a pretty nasty looking wound, but this will here heal. It does. And they will be disfigured as a consequence. That is right. So, it, But we won't get to this yet. What we're going to get to... I want to, to know what happens to the worm. I'm going to tell you. All right. But the, the larvae <laughs> are swimming in the fresh water. They are. And if you would just... <laughs> go like this in the water so that they would go someplace else before you scooped up the water to take back to your village. You might have few or no larvae in your bucket. But the moment you step in the water, you're stepping in the water to scoop up the water it's to take back. So it. it's self-fulfilling. Wow! It's right next to your foot. You scoop this big bucket of water. You put on your shoulder and you, and you might... Put it down and sit there for a while and relax yeah. and enjoy life. And, and finally, finally, Vince, your foot doesn't hurt anymore. Mm -hmm. <gasps> oh, it feels so good. And your neighbor arrives and you're sitting there and you're talking about first your foot and then their foot and then how's the kids and how's the wife and how's the uncle. And, you know, last week we had a, and this, it's going to rain. It looks like a, how did the Knicks do last night? They won. No, no this is not <coughs> Nick. No, no, of course not. Of course not. But they might have followed soccer or field hockey or something else. The fact is that it's used as a social gathering place. It's not just a place to get water. Yeah, if you yeah. have to walk that far to get the water, you better do something else while you're there too. Three days. Three days. Now these people are going to walk back three days with this open blister on their. Not foot. only that, they're going to walk back with all this social information for their villages too. Yeah, they're going to get infected. On Uncle Louis says you don't write enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know that sort of thing. So imagine the social networks that are built up around these ancient step wells. They're mm -hmm. ancient step wells. They go back to prehistory times, and they're found throughout. Uh, India, the Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa. So do we think this infection is ancient as well? We do. Of course we do. Sure. Now these people who... Are you going to tell us what happens to the worm, right? Yeah, I will. So the point of the story so far is that we've now scooped up mm -hmm. not just water and not just larvae, mm. but these are open ecosystems. Yeah. Let's just look at them as micro ecosystems. And so inside of these micro ecosystems that are nutrient enriched, mm -hmm. you have all kinds of life forms there. In fact, it's a great place to go to catch malaria in some instances because the mosquito larvae are all over the place mm -hmm. and they're, they're breeding constantly because the water is always there, right? Yeah. yeah. So what do mosquito larvae eat? They eat plankton. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're filter feeders and Part of the planktonic um, life is divided into two parts, plants and animals. So plants, algae. 
right? right? Blue-green yeah. algae and regular right. algae. And the animals, rotifers and small crustaceans like cyclops and daphnia, mm -hmm. water fleas they're called. And remember, Vince, I know that this is dim because we discussed this a long time You're ago. You're saying I'm dim? You're saying I'm dim? No, I'm saying the, the memory of this happening yes. might be dim. <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> but that's a good take on that anyway. <laughs> Did I say you were dim? Let me think. I'm thinking. <laughs> So, if you go back to the uh, session that we had on tapeworms, that was a long time ago. I know that was it's in the dim dim memory of the past, right? Okay. So, mm -hmm. there was a tapeworm called Diphyllobothrium latum. I remember. Yeah, ah, he I does. Remember. The light bulb went back on again. It brightened. It was always on, Vince. Yeah. So that's why they say dim, yeah, right? It's still on, right? So you're now you're bright. Mm -hmm. Do you get that? I'm dim and I'm bright. It's it. all about a light bulb. <clears throat> Soon we're going to have energy-saving LED light bulbs, and we won't be able to use those analogies anymore. Diphyllobothrium. Diphyllobothrium latum. It, too, uses a copepod for part of its life cycle. Copepod. You didn't mention copepod yet, did Crustacean. You? I just mentioned crustaceans or water fleas, cyclops, So uh, copepod is part of the life cycle. They're here. part of the zooplankton. Right. Okay. And these little things have to eat too. So mosquito larvae eat them. What do they eat? They eat even smaller things. Yeah, they eat these larvae. They do. They do. And Vince, among other things, big mistake. Uh, so there are a lot of these larvae released from one person. There are, and there's must be lots of copepods out there too. Then, right? Or lots of these the small copepods eat the larvae, but they don't kill them. They don't kill them, I presume. No, they don't. But they infect them, and they go to the next stage of their life cycle inside the copepod. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, they're in this big bucket, and the bucket is on the shoulder of this person, right. and this person is walking all the way back to their village. And inside the bucket, this life cycle is evolving. So the copepod is infected by the larva. What does the larva do in the copepod? Uh, it molts once and becomes the infectious stage for humans. So now inside the copepod. inside the copepod. Okay. So what it means is that you don't, you have to drink the water with the infected copepod to become infected with Dracunculus. Yeah, that's so they're drinking this water with all sorts of flora in it. Yeah, and you have to drink at least two copepods. And one they don't with boil it when they get home. Some do, and that would take care of everything, right? It, everything, including the microbes that are in the water too, that will Bacteria, induce yeah. Salmonella, Shigella, yeah. toxigenic E. coli. But most people don't. And probably on the way home, they take a sip or two because they're thirsty. Of course. And not only that, fossil fuels are non-existent. So they're burning things, right? Now, the person who had the worm... And so they don't drink. usually boil the water. They don't usually okay, boil They're going to drink the contaminated water, but they won't be infected again, I presume. Or will they? Or will they? But their family, who doesn't have a worm, will now get it as a consequence. I didn't of say there was a permanent immunity to this. Yeah, it's a good question. Will they get infected? Do we know? Yeah, they, can they will. Get, they over can and get. over. I'm not sure how many times. Hmm. What a cycle! What a cycle! You have to walk three miles to bring back or, the larvae, or longer. <laughs> I know. Sometimes it's, it's just a week. crazy. It's a week. Wow. These these women that do this, mostly women, are just heroic. In every sense of that word. They have children waiting for them at home. They have this awful disease on their feet. And their, their, their job is to bring back life-saving water, which mm -hmm. could take their lives rather than save it. Why would it take their life? Because, because of, of the, the other microbes in it? and could have salmonella typhimurium. Everyone's going to have disfigured feet. Not everybody, but a lot of people. Have they done epidemiology to show all this? They have. Cycle? They have. They have. In fact, that's what we want to discuss is the control program. So that this... Um, you drink the infected cope pod. You have no clue because they're microscopic, right? Right. And where does this go in your intestines? Pass well, through the stomach? It passes through the stomach, and the worm is digested away from the copepod. In your stomach? In your stomach. And, and then, we, then when the, the worm intestine. gets to the small intestine, it penetrates into the wall of the small intestine. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, it's a total mystery. You don't know. I, I mean, don't know. It just somehow it ends up in your leg. We have two... No, no, we have to go through two more molts for it to become an adult worm. And then once it's an adult, it has to mate. Mm -hmm. And then once it mates, the worm has to then seek out the lower extremities and then grow up. Yeah, you have a, on your life cycle here, you have <laughs> larvae <coughs> enter abdominal wall, 
and then there's an arrow. It says larvae <laughs> enter subcutaneous tissues. We don't know how. We don't have a clue. Could be through the circulation, right? Could. But we're not sure. Not sure. So the it does two molts, and then it eventually gets its way back to your lower yeah, extremity. All, all nematodes molt four times. Four times. And then an, an adult. And then it makes its way to that lower extremity where it then begins to grow. It takes a year to get from this little larval stage, fourth molt, to a, a one meter long adult. A year, a full year. Where does the male come in? At what point? We don't know. After uh, it's when a, does the fertilization occur? No, no idea. Where does it occur? No idea. Correct. And we'll never know. Well, not if you. We have no animal model for this. Particular and we're about person. to eradicate it. And we're about to eradicate it. All right. So in 1981, six. It says here, 1986, WHO called for eradication of dracunculiasis, which is the name of this disease. Yeah, right? but I want to go back to 1981. Sure, let's go. Time machine. Yeah. So you, now you're actually let's do 1980, which is even better. Because you're now sitting around the table at WHO, the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. I was a postdoc in 1980. Wow, interesting. You were here, a I famous was, professor. That's right. <laughs> I was two years away from getting tenure. <laughs> Thank God. Um, although <laughs> it's a mixed blessing, trust me out there. Um, they're sitting around deciding how they can best combat a growing problem. This yeah. disease. No, not this disease. Oh, they okay. didn't even discuss this disease then. They didn't have a... Malaria? They, they had no interest in this disease whatsoever. They didn't care about this disease. So what could they have cared about, do you think? Malaria? No, nah, they had another group worried about them. Mm. <sighs> Toxoplasma? No, it's not even in this book. What they're worried about? Yeah, diarrheal disease. Okay, diarrheal disease, sure. So the best indicator for a, for population uh, explosions are high infant mortality rates. Mm -hmm. And the high infant mortality rates were linked to ignorance and poverty and disease. So ignorance, poverty, and disease equals high, mort high infant mortality rates and, as a result, high birth rates. So how can you control population growth and the best way they thought they could do this is to interrupt the transmission of diarrheal diseases, which is a logical step. They could supply fresh water for these people <coughs> by installing borehole hand-pumped water mm -hmm. from controlled wells. Right. And they identified, in the rural setting at least, the biggest uh, common source for diarrheal diseases were, were these step wells particularly throughout India. <clears throat> so okay. India has a rich history of uh, public health intervention strategies for malaria control. At one point, the uh, number of cases for malaria in India went from 7 million to 70,000. And it's because India has a wide network of community-based health care. And they're good at this. So if you could make use of that widespread network and the Red Cross by the way had a big presence there as well so they had, <coughs> they had CDC, WHO and Red Cross all working together to try to lower the infant mortality rate and they're, they're <laughs> the program was based on identifying where contaminated water still existed and so you needed an indicator species that said these people are subjected to polluted water but you don't have the luxury of a, a bacteriological test in a laboratory. You have to do this by looking. It's hard to do. So what they decided to do was to use the presence or absence of Dracunculus metanensis as an indicator for the polluted water or not. So the healthcare worker, all they had to do was go around to the villages in the rural areas and look at the feet. And if they saw somebody with a scar, they said, ah, dracunculus, ah, polluted water, ah, high infant mortality rate, ah, diarrheal disease, ah. Now, does this community use a step well? And if they do, here's what we're going to do for you. We're going to cover over the step well. And we're going to install a new hand-pumped well next to it, and the water will be pristine. And you will interrupt the transmission cycle of dracunculus, 
and diarrheal diseases. Now, we're, we don't care about Dracunculus. Now, <clears throat> you know, that's like Mitt Romney saying he doesn't care about the poor. He probably does care about the poor, you know, but he says that's being taken care of by another group. That's what he said. I'm not sure that's right either. But when they said we don't care about Dracunculus, Dracunculus is a minor medical problem compared to the infant mortality rate from diarrheal diseases. So if you had to triage these two problems, you'd put infant diarrhea way up over here and you'd put Dracunculus way down over here. But <clears throat> because their control measure would get rid of both of them, and because everyone understood this disease, and try to explain bacterial diseases and viral diseases and infant mortality, it's a harder cell. Mm -hmm. This is an easy cell because everybody wants to get rid of this. The people think this is more important than infant diarrhea. Because once you live past the age of five, then everybody gets this. Okay, <clears throat> and they already accepted the fact that little children are going to die from all kinds of things before they get to be the age of five, including malaria and diarrheal diseases. Those were the two big killers. So malaria has been working on in the next room over in WHO. So in 1980, they come up with this fantastic, easy to implicate, implement control program. Dig wells. Dig wells, right. Dig wells next to the covered over step wells. Okay. If the people can no longer use the step wells, they, they won't contaminate them. They can use the water and you can get a glass of water like I'm holding up now that Vince likes to drink from every morning without yeah. worrying about they, catching did they the disease. Dig wells? Did they start doing it? <coughs> well, let's see what happened next. So in 1981, yeah. they released this program to uh, India and the Middle East, not to Africa. Mm -hmm. And they used the decrease in dracunculosis as the um, metric. Right. This, so this they said, people's feet, they, basically. Right? They said when, when, when dracunculus goes right. down, infant mortality rates should go down too because we're controlling both with the same control program. But something went dramatically wrong. Uh, the thing that went wrong, okay, and this is by the fact that I attended lots of <laughs> tropical medicine meetings. In fact, I was even on their uh, their council for a while. So I heard these stories, but I can't document them with printed word. So what you're about to hear is my recollection of what happened next. But I'm pretty sure that we could verify this by uh, calling up a guy by the name of Donald Hopkins, who works at the Carter Center, <coughs> who now is in control of uh, the Dracunculus Control Program. And so here's how this evolved. <coughs> The, the rumor had it that health workers, particularly in India, would go to these rural villages and identify foci of infection for dracunculus. They would gather the people together. They would then tell them what their plan was. And in no case did any of the local people agree with the plan. To and, cover up the well and yeah. drill one. And why do you think they didn't agree with Hedgman's? I don't know. Why? Come on, they're going to save their kids from infant mortalities, from diarrheal diseases, and they're going to wipe out uh, dracunculus at the same time. What's wrong with that? They don't want their well covered up? Why didn't they want their well covered up, Vince? Ah, uh, social stuff. Uh -huh. They talk at the well. Can't they talk at the pump? Uh -huh. And they can't soak their feet. Yeah, but they won't have to anymore. They can't cool down. Cool down. And they can't relax. <laughs> and they can't have a life because it's all about work. God damn it. And I have to go here and I have to go there. Don't I get a moment's peace yeah. out of this? You're going to cover up my step well now? What next? Well, I won't have anything left at all. Hmm. So they wouldn't let them cover up the well? Well, they started to ask questions. You yeah, see, now the health workers were only instructed to tell them about the control program for dracunculus. Mm -hmm. They said nothing, mentioned nothing about diarrheal diseases. Mm -hmm. Don't go near that subject. Too difficult, too complicated. Okay. T tell them about this one. Okay. okay, so if I'm sitting there and I don't want my step well covered over, I'm going to want to know everything there is to know about this first to make sure you're giving it to me straight. Right. All right, so they started to describe. They said, well, how do I catch it? You don't even know how you catch this. Oh, you catch this by drinking contaminated water. That's why we want to cover over your step wells, because that will prevent your water from becoming contaminated. Ah, oh, yes, but we've been using this well for a thousand years. This is my family well. I mean, you can see my name etched on the stones over here. Come on, what's wrong with you people? So well, tell me some more about this worm. I'm making all this up, by the yeah. way. The listeners have to know that I'm telling them a story right now. 
but I imagine these stories were told again and again mm -hmm. and again. And these health workers were so frustrated because a lot of them didn't know the life cycle of the parasite. So they had to go back and learn it. Mm. And once they did, they came back to them and they said, well, it's not the water that you're worried about here. It's these little water fleas that swim in the water. And your water will always have those little water fleas. And as long as those water fleas are there, they're going to eat the larva of this parasite. And then when you scoop the water up and take it back to your village, you're going to catch another round of this infection. And, and that's how you catch it. So now some clever person, I mean, these are uneducated, right? You'd, you'd consider these people living in extreme poverty, that they have no formal education whatsoever, but they've been living this way for thousands of years. You don't think that takes skill to live like that for thousands of years continuously? Sure. Of yeah. course it does. So there are traditions that are handed down, that are learned, that are incorporated into behavior that allows them to survive in some very harsh conditions. So they started to ask other questions, all right? And one of their big questions was, well, how big are these little things? I mean, can we see them? <laughs> you asked the same question before. Can you see these things? You can barely see them. I think if you held them up to the light and allowed the light to shine through the water, you could see these little things jumping around inside. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's raised tropical fish uh, knows about Daphnia because they're sold as fish food for the baby cuppies that are born, right? Because they can eat, that's, that's zooplankton, zooplankton. It's the same organism that Metchnikoff worked on to study phagocytosis. It's an easy obtained mm -hmm. organism. And so there's a whole range of these crustaceans, micro crustaceans as they're called. In fact, the Orthodox Jewish community of Williamsburg, New York City, the Williamsburg section of New York, uh, found out that the public drinking water supply from the Catskills contains small numbers of these crustaceans, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't drink the water because they're not allowed to eat crustaceans. Right. So that was a controversy what for a while. What they do about that? That's a good question. Actually, I think if you installed a purulator filter, you could avoid it. Oh, wait. <laughs> you mean I can filter this and get rid of them? The people in the villages said this. The people in the village said that first. <laughs> well, and, and, but that's what they said, too. They said, how big are they? Yeah. And they said, well, you can almost, you can see. They're, they're, yeah, you know, yeah. they're about to, Really? Well we'll, uh, we'll just filter them out. They said, well, what happens if we just take some chintz? Mm -hmm. Chintz is the cheapest cloth you can imagine, right? That's why the word chintzy is used. Yeah. You look chintzy. Change your shirt, for Thank God's sakes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be here for Wednesday. Try chintz. the deal. So, <laughs> so if you took chintz just as it is, as a single layer, you wouldn't be able to filter anything through it because it's too thin and it's flimsy and it's friable. And it's, but if you folded this back on itself three or four times, and every woman in every village wore a sari made out of it, mm -hmm. which is why I think this whole procedure started in India first, because that's where we had the maximum number of step wells, and that's where chintz is a common material. Mm -hmm. These clever, clever people. How can I prevent dracunculosis and still keep my step well? How could they prevent WHO from covering the well, though? I don't understand. Uh, because it required local health workers to mitigate the WHO edict. WHO has been heavy-handed in some other things, mm. and it didn't work. So they knew they had to enlist local people to help them. And if the local people don't agree with it, they have to find another strategy. So they said, we're going to filter the water through chintz. Yeah, and they said, first of all, would, do you think that would work? They said, well, try it and see. Yeah. So they did. So they took two pails and they took chintz. And, you know, I'm sure they did the experiment. They did one layer. Now they're still there. They did two layers. Now they're still there. They did three layers. They're gone. Okay, three layers. Just to be safe, make it four. Mm -hmm. So remember, four layers. When you go to the well, take two buckets. One slides into the other. Lightweight. Uh, take your sari. Unwrap it. Fold it four times, put it over bucket number one, take bucket number two, scoop, put it into the thing, bam. Goodbye crustaceans, goodbye dracunculus. So did this have an impact? Wait, on, on I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Okay. What's wrong with this picture, Vince? Oh, the bacteria and the virus is darn, going through. Darn, darn, darn. You're right. They're going right through. How could that happen? And so WHO screwed up big time by just focusing on the copepods. I'm not sure I would blame them entirely for this. The, I would. 
<laughs> no, I'm not. I don't know who to point the finger at on this one, except that the can't point it at the ferrets this time. Nope, you can't. What was withheld from the people was the true aim of the program. Yeah, exactly. You can't withhold this stuff. You're if, gonna get backfired. I think that's what happened here. Wow. All right. And so ultimately, what happened is they they got rid of one thing. How long did it take to have an impact on dracunculiasis? It was almost immediate. Wow. And that's where everybody caught on to this. They said, hey, last year we had dracunculus in our village. This year we don't have any. Low-tech solution. Low, low, low-tech solution. <laughs> so the, the, word spread, the word spread, hey, and, and you don't have to lose your step well. Hey, I can tell you. Yeah. You can keep your step well. <laughs> yeah! And we can get rid of this awful worm at the same time. Isn't this great? And, of course, the infant mortality rate remains exactly the same. But you know what? They have accepted the infant mortality rate for many, 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 many mm -hmm. millennia, not just years. They just have more kids, right? They, you know, that's a normal thing. This is an abnormal thing. Yeah. So now we can get rid of the abnormal thing. Wow. So that... What the, was WHO's reaction to this? They probably... <laughs> I'm sure that they were entirely frustrated by the the unintended consequence of a well-intended public health program. Right. So what they ended up doing, of course, was fostering this as the method of choice for getting rid of dracunculus throughout the entire world. Yeah. So uh, between the years uh, 1990 and 2011... The amount of dracunculosis went from 10 million cases a year throughout the world to less than 10,000 cases throughout the world. And one of the big places that it still exists right now is in southern Sudan, which is a very difficult area to work in, as yeah. you well know. Yeah, yeah, sure. So there's a video that we're going to put up for the, for the really? viewing audience What's to that? look at. Uh, it's a video by Jimmy Carter, of all things. Because I want you to know that... Uh, of all the presidents who have ever lived, Jimmy Carter has done the most for humanity in the time that he's been alive the, the, over any other president after he was president. Mm -hmm. So founding the Carter Center in Atlanta, Georgia, and devoting all of his resources to humanity, Habitat for Humanity is his, mm -hmm. right. and this Dracunculus Control Program is his, and he also worked on river blindness, onchocerciasis. So he's been a remarkable individual at every level, and he's had wonderful help from a fantastic uh, physician, parasitologist by the name of Donald Hopkins, who in the old days, I was a friend of Donald's, but uh, I've lost track of him, and I'm sure he's lost track of me as well. So if he listens to this, he's getting uh, an accolade and a kudo from me because he's stayed with this thing to the end. And it's possible that it, within his lifetime, dracunculosis in humans, at least, will be extinct. Just by filtering the water. Just but, well, they did two things, actually. Mm -hmm. they've, they've included another control program to use a, a compound called Temaphos. Mm -hmm. Temaphos is an anti-invertebrate killer. It kills mosquito larvae. It yeah, kills crustaceans. Copods. kills copods. Do they put it in the wells? They do, but, but they had to obtain permission in each of these cases because these are sacred places because... Yeah. Your water is essential to everything, right? So this, this video takes place in southern Sudan. We'll put it up online for the it's viewers. It's a Sudan dracunculus video? Uh, it's, that, what should I search for? Uh, what I'm looking for? Carter Center Control Program. Okay. And I have the reference for it, by the way. I can email that to you after the show. It says so, here that guinea worm, uh, it's called guinea worm. Well, also. the reason why it's called guinea worm is because the epicenter for the, no the, the most number of cases was in Guinea in uh, West Africa. Okay. Guinea worm eradication is considered one of the most impressive accomplishments ever achieved by a former U.S. president. This is absolutely correct. Having been president probably helped him to achieve this, though. Right? I would think. Yeah. Giving him some resources to, to work with. Of course, he had lots of those before that, too. But, but his heart's in the right place, and his, uh, his vision is incredibly focused on this problem, now this problem, now this problem. And that's his virtue. That's great. He's still doing this. He is still doing this. And by the way, he's a fly fisherman. Really? <laughs> so he cares about the environment. He cares about intact ecosystems. He cares about the important things in life that everyone else should be at least concerned about. So we're at about 10,000 cases? Yeah. So how long will it take to eradicate this? Well, given um, 
the opportunity for interacting with these communities that are in extreme conflict, mm -hmm. not just culturally, but also warfare, open warfare. Whenever you've got these things going on at the same time, it's very difficult to institute any control program. The Carter Center gives out special cloth. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have to use chintz anymore. <laughs> they've, they've got this square of cloth that easily fits into almost every vessel that people use to gather water in. And uh, it's guaranteed to filter out the copepods. Yeah. But it's yeah. not, it's unfortunate that it's not guaranteed to filter out the bacteria. So when you yeah. see this video, you will observe that uh, former President Carter has around his neck, as we have around our neck, an identification. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have that around his neck. He's got something that looks like a little penny whistle. Mm -hmm. But it's not a penny whistle. What do you think it is? It's a water flute. A water flute. And you stick it in the water and suck it up through the flute and it filters out all the microbes. So when you want to drink the water, you do this? Right. So it's a two-pronged approach. Mm. So but he realizes you have to do something for infantile diseases as well. Yeah. Unfortunately, the little babies can't suck water up through this thing. Right. All right. So the solution to that would be, under ordinary circumstances, to just boil the water. Mm -hmm. But they can't afford the fossil fuel because they don't have any. So they use yeah. trees and, br and bushes and things like this to make fires. And, and you can imagine lots of people living in the rural areas and elephants too. And you're in a 10-year drought now in sub-Saharan Africa. There's almost no wood left to, to burn. Hmm. So I'm going to cook your food. How are you going yeah. to survive? So it's a it's a, a desperate situation in some cases. We, have, we I guess we, most of us here don't ever think about how difficult life is under these conditions because we take everything for granted. Exactly. So let's let's go back to the history of the Caduceus now, Vince, to discuss. One more question before yeah, you please, do that. Yeah, please, please, please. Was there any attempt to uh, intervene in any of these cases of drachunculiasis? But you said there's no local medical care. But if there were, what could you do? Well, that's right. So how do you cure this thing, right? And it's a local folklorica cure. Mm -hmm. You take a small twig, the diameter of a, of a thin pencil, not a thick pencil. I can't find one I here. I don't have here. thin pencils. You don't, well, thinner a, than this. Okay. Uh, about maybe... Uh, a twig, yeah. A twig, yeah. a twig. And you, you can see the head of the worm. After the bubble is burst. As, right. After the blister is burst. And you grab the head of that worm and you twist it onto the stick. And the and worm you, is saying no, no? <laughs> the worm is saying no, no. Anybody out there who whose father uh, and you would go out on the lawn at night with a flashlight with a piece of red uh, cellophane mm -hmm. over it mm -hmm. to hunt night crawlers yeah. to go fishing, <laughs> knows that when you grab the worms, they don't want you to pull them out of the hole. Yeah. And you have to pull and then stop. And they will eventually relinquish their hold, ah. and then they'll come out. But if you pull right away, you'll just end up with a half worm. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to end up with a half worm here, Vince, because if you do... The hold that this worm has on your immune system is released. And it's essentially ima like imagining uh, in the cartoons with someone with a gigantic sledgehammer and here's a fly and they want to kill the fly. And they raise the sledgehammer and they come down on the fly and something stops the sledgehammer within an inch of the fly. And the fly looks up and <laughs> smiles. <laughs> And then the cartoon character finds out what's doing this and pushes the other button and bam, down on the fly comes the hammer. Meanwhile, the fly is gone. So we call that innocent bystander effect. When this worm is killed accidentally, mm -hmm. then all of the tissue surrounding the remaining part of the worm in your leg becomes instantly inflamed. Wow. The fiery serpent of the Israelites, Vince. That's the fiery part. That's where it comes from? That's the Breaking fiery the worm. That's the fiery part. Wow. And what happens is, you see how this blister looks? Yes. Your whole leg looks the same way. Wow. And imagine how susceptible you are now to intercurrent infections and secondary, all kinds of awful things. So they called this the fiery serpent because it burned yeah, up and down your leg. that's and right. And the Well, they sort of translate that into a religious story. Fiery serpent. They, they made a religious story out of it because uh, they, had to, they had to find some good use for this thing, right? So apparently there's this uh, 
mythological story, and I'm sure some of the listeners will take offense at what I'm about to say, but that's only because they're literalists, okay? You and I are not literalists. So when, when you read the Bible, even if you did read the Bible and you wanted to believe every word in the Bible, this would be a hard one to believe. When Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, according to this story, and it's written in the Old Testament, you can actually go back to the Dead Sea Scrolls and find this story. It's written in Hebrew. So it, that means that it was written at around the time that it happened. All right. So out from Egypt comes all of these people, and they get into the desert. They, they call it the wilderness, the firmament. And imagine you're one of those people, and you're not exactly hooked on the knowledge that's been given to you by Moses, who, who could have been a rogue pharaoh, by the way. Uh, one of the mythologies of that uh, Egyptian myth involves a rogue pharaoh who had a point of view that was quite different from all the other pharaohs, namely that there's only one god, not multiple gods. And so we know of a pharaoh in Egypt that actually um, Ankhenaten was the mm -hmm. god, mm -hmm. was the you know, single god pharaoh, and of course they killed him. Why? Because he put all those priests out of business. <laughs> They wanted their jobs back. <laughs> but at that time, when Akhenaten was, was killed, there could have been another person in line for that pharaohship who agreed with Akhenaten, and a lot of people agreed with him too, mm -hmm. and they decided to form another country. So they moved out. All right? So here they are in the middle of a desert with no water, matzo bread for food, and this crazy rogue pharaoh Mm -hmm. Telling them that they're going to lead, he's going to lead them to the promised land of milk and honey. All right, how crazy does that sound to somebody? They had second thoughts. Many of these people had second thoughts. Wait a minute, you know, okay, maybe multiple gods isn't so bad after all. <laughs> maybe we can deal with this. You know, Ra is okay. That's true. That's the sun god, but but there might be others too. Who knows? So they started to complain and bitch and moan, just like people do. And according to this biblical, mythological uh, story, uh, God got pissed. Now, God, God shouldn't get pissed, right? God mm -hmm. created all this, so God probably knew this was all going to happen, so according to some people at least. So, but the fact is that this story says God became angry mm -hmm. with, the, with the mutineers and, and sent fiery serpents among them that then bit the ones that complained. Only the ones that complained. Mm -hmm. they could, the snakes were very discriminatory at those days. <laughs> they, could, they only bit people who, who had an angry disposition. And so these people began to die. And Moses looked around and said, you know, if this continues, <laughs> and of course it's going to get worse before it gets better, right? Because <laughs> other people will agree with the ones that just died because, wow, look what happened. Oh, no, we're all doomed. They, Moses supposedly was asked by the people to intervene to God to say, please, okay, we are, we're sorry for bitching and moaning. We won't do this anymore. So God says, oh, so you want forgiveness, do you? Okay, here's what you do. Now, this is the f most fanciful part because if God were as merciful as we would like God to be, God would have just said, okay, 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 okay. You're sorry? Okay, that's fine. Serpents go away. But that's not what he did. Or she. God said to Moses, All right, you want to help your people? He said, Construct a bronze serpent and wrap it around your staff. And whomever is bitten by a fiery serpent, if they touch your staff, they'll be saved. Now, why would God say that to Moses? Why would God do that? Like, come it doesn't on. make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. But but wrapping a fiery serpent around a stick to be saved like makes good sense. <laughs> so drunkunculiasis. If you took if you took what was already going on and morphed that into yeah, sure. a religious parable. Because there was certainly the disease at the time. Yeah, right? of course. And yeah. it was all over the Middle East too. And it was on the, in the steppe wells in India, but there were lots of steppe wells throughout the Middle East as nice. well. It seems to fit the picture of what the actual event was that led up to that particular story. I like it. That's what you wrote in your chapter, I presume. It is. It What's is. the name of your chapter? 
It's <laughs> the name of the chapter is called "All's Well That Ends Wells." Yeah, very good. <laughs> I think the name of this episode should be "The Fiery Serpent." Yes, don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. I'll so, find that video. Nice. They they nice. went they went from the fiery serpent and the bronze. By the way, how long do you think it would take anybody to find enough copper and tin? <laughs> to construct a bronze object and then smelt it and forge it into a snake. And I didn't realize that Moses was so talented. I mean, he, not only did he write the Ten Commandments, but he also made a, a bronze serpent. Yeah, well, I guess it could be done if people have the will. And if God they, gives them the ability, they right? do it. But this must have been very slow-acting venom. Yeah. Because it yeah. must have taken some time. Well, you know, when you start breaking these things down into the reality part, they don't make sense. But no, uh, sure. they're not supposed to make sense. They're supposed to be parables. Yeah. For you shouldn't doubt your leaders. But they're based on some aspect of reality, as you suggested in this case. That's right. Pulling out the worm with a stick. Yeah, of course. A fiery serpent. That's right. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here we are. Nice with, story, Dixon. I'm huh? just... Glad we decided to revisit this. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me it's too. A good one. And and you know it's it's in time because uh, if we had done this next year, this worm may not even be there. So so when it happens, we'll note it. The point is that if this worm becomes extinct, will humanity have lost something besides a disease-producing organism? We will we have lost some information that we will eventually regret. I want to know why this can suppress the immune system. I think that's so magical. Do I. That would be very. I mean, this worm does a great job. A what are the fabulous compounds job. that do it? We could That's use right. those in we, some way, couldn't we? We, we certainly could. But it, this is a lousy model, though, because it takes a year for this sure, thing to grow sure, up. But, Even if it was okay to use humans. But it's not. No, we can't do that. But you can imagine so purifying wait. things from these worms and seeing what they we do. We have the genome of this worm. Yeah, it's been sequenced? Uh, it's partially sequenced, so but we have it. So let's look for... Proteins that could antagonize immune responses. So this is let's great. lay it out for us, Vince. What yeah. would you do if you were the PI for the grant that had the cDNA library for the adult worm? What would you do with it? Well, I'd look first at all the proteins and uh, see if I could find some signatures of immune mimics, mimics of known immune proteins, cytokines or cytokine receptors, for example, uh, molecules on immune cells. Just scan through and see if you find some signatures. And then you could express those and go into a model system like a mouse and see if they have some effect. How about another filarial worm that grows up faster? Related to this one? Yeah, there is one, you by could, the way. Yeah. There's one called Brugia malayi. It infects gerds. And <laughs> so you could transfect the Brugia malayi organism with, with another these genes. with these genes yeah, sure. and at the same time knock out the ones that Brugia has and, and substitute these in place and see whether or not it does the That's same thing. That's a great idea. You know, I think they should complete the genome of this worm <laughs> okay, so, before it's wiped out. So I have a section in this book that I've just finished called Plowshare Concepts. Mm -hmm. So people will wonder what I mean by that. The name of the book is Parasites, People, and Plowshares. So plowshares, where the heck does that come from? Where does that term come from? And I've, I've taken it from a complete phrase that says, turn their swords into plowshares. Yeah. All right? So that's what you do when you make peace in the world. And in fact, Vince, Hermes, did I tell you the mythology of Hermes and how he came about these two snakes? No, not on this show. Would you like me to? Yeah. Okay, so we can go back to the, the modern caduceus and trace it back okay. to its origins. Okay, so the, I just described the WHO caduceus. So if you go online, you can see the WHO caduceus is a single staff with a single snake. Okay. But it's not a snake and it's not a staff. It's a stick and a worm. Mm -hmm. And WHO somehow intuitively knew this, and they're using it as their symbol, uh, although they didn't explain it fully, they're more um, iconically correct. Okay. The two-snake caduceus came from Hermes back in ancient Greek mythology. It's a, it's a Greek myth, okay? Uh, there was a time in Greek history where... Yeah, they, here it is. This is the WHO version. Yeah, right and it's here. only one snake and one stick. So, so why did they do this? Yeah, exactly. Why did they do that? WHO was founded in 1948. Mm -hmm. So, why did they pick one snake and one stick? Somebody 
maybe with a wry sense of humor or with a wry sense of history <clears throat> or with a sense of rye whiskey, I'm not sure which, uh, ended up inventing a symbol which has application to a real problem, mm -hmm. and that is dracunculus. And that is a symbol for, for polluted water, by the way. Right. So here we have, now, now let's talk about the modern caduceus. It's got wings, it's got a staff, and it's got two snakes. Right. So where do the wings come from? Hermes? Yeah, his feet. His feet. Yeah. Of course, he was the god of messages, right? Yeah. But, but he was more than that. He was more than that. Okay. To the Greeks, Hermes was also the god of tranquility. Mm -hmm. I think because the more you know, the more you're able to deal with your world. And Hermes was an information gathering and distributing person. Okay. And Mercury became the same. Mm -hmm. So Hermes one day is just hanging around doing not much, playing his lyre that he made out of a tortoise shell and special hairs that he collected from some magical place, and he could play beautiful music. And Apollo heard this. Apollo was the sun god, right? So Apollo says, hey, Hermes, where'd you get the nice lyre? <laughs> and Hermes says, that's for you to know and for me to find out. No, the other way. Yeah, the way it's around, for me yeah. to know and for you to find out. So Apollo says, oh, don't be like that. Don't be like that. He says, look what I have. So Hermes looks over to Apollo. I'm just making all this up, of course. <laughs> but this is my fractured Greek mythology <laughs> moment. <laughs> so Hermes looks at Apollo and says, hey, um, where did you get that staff? And Apollo says, the same place you got your lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and so they both laughed. And they both laughed. Ah! He says, you know, I've played this long enough. He says, uh, what does that staff do anyway? And so Apollo says, ah, it's a magical staff. It will do things that you don't expect and they'll all be good. But in order to find that out, you'd have to let me have your liar, won't you? So Apollo looks at Apollo, looks at Hermes, Hermes looks at Apollo, and says, you know, I've played this long enough. I've gotten my worth out of it. And, and, and Apollo says, you know, I can only use this thing so often. During the night, it's useless to me because, of course, I don't shine at night. I only mm. shine during the daytime, right? So they exchange gifts. It was, it's been like Christmas. You know, oh, it's your birthday. I didn't know that. Here's your staff. You're going to have this. And as, a, as a, a special gift, Apollo says, I'm going to take these two little ribbons that I've hung, hung, hung on to for many, many years. I don't know how they measure time in the, mm. in the world of the gods. And he ties them onto the top of the staffs. And that is two little ribbons. Mm -hmm. He says, they have some magical powers too. Ooh, Hermes is intrigued. Okay, so Apollo says, well, I'll see you later. I got to go across the sky now because I have to, you know, it's daytime. So Hermes says, hey, have a good day. And I, I'll look forward to seeing you, you know. And I'll just go wandering about the countryside. Now that I can't play my lyre. Gee, I wonder what... Hey, you know what? This isn't such a bad walking stick, though, you know? And okay, now I can go further because before that I used to get tired and now I can use this staff to help me along. And one day, Hermes is walking along, minding his own business, when he sees before him two gigantic snakes. And they're both male snakes. And you know what happens when you put two male snakes together, Vince? You get a fight. Mm -hmm. These are fighting for territory. So Hermes is appalled by this and, and terrified. And he wants to do something to prevent them from harming, forget them, everybody else in the neighborhood. I mean, once the fight's over and the winner is there, he's going to take out his revenge on all the people. So whatever the case, he takes this staff and he starts poking at the snakes and a miracle happens. The staff goes right between the snakes, and the snakes suddenly, it's as though you had sprinkled fairy dust on them. <laughs> or PCB. <laughs> PCP, rather. <laughs> yeah, angel dust. <laughs> and the next thing you know, the snakes are saying, Ow, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to squeeze you so hard. And, and Joe is saying, that's all right, Al. You know, it happens all the time. He says, hey, you, you want to go out for a couple of eggs? You know, they eat bird eggs. Um, and, the, and Herbie says, well, guys, he says, why don't you just jump up on my staff? 
and you can go wherever I go from now on. And the snakes look at each other and say, you want to do that? Yeah, I want to do that. Okay, let's go. So next thing you know, uh, and then there's these little ribbons up there. I'm oh, sorry. So he takes the ribbons off and he discards them. I don't know what Apollo had to say about that. He must have been Apollo'd uh, at the very active. Uh, but nonetheless, here's now Hermes with these two snakes. And they're at peace with each other. So the staff of Hermes became known as the staff of tranquility. So that was the beginning of the modern caduceus. Now there's another player in this called uh, Escalapus. And Escalapus also is credited with inventing the word caduceus because it's a Greek word. It means caduceus in Greek, but it's not spelled that way and it doesn't pronounce that way either like a kerkalon or something like that. But that word translated into the, the, I guess, Latin first and then into the Middle English and then finally English morphed into the word Caduceus. And instead of being a symbol for tranquility, it morphed into a symbol for healing. And the next thing you know, yeah. Yeah. I'm sitting at home the other night watching a fabulous movie that everybody out there must be familiar with, and that's called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Mm -hmm. And there's Nurse Ratchet. She's got a caduceus. She's on her. got a caduceus right on her collar, so you can't avoid seeing it. Yeah. And it is a symbol of authority. Hmm. And it means you will obey me because I know how to cure you. <laughs> but you don't know shit from Shinola. <laughs> <laughs> you can bleep that out of WHO, no, I'll leave it in. Why did WHO uh, just put one snake on its staff? Well, I think the, the person who made that logo had insight. Mm -hmm. into the origins of the caduceus. And if you want a caduceus, I'll give you a caduceus, but it'll be the caduceus that makes the most medical sense. Mm -hmm. And so they picked that one. Worm. It's well, supposed to be a worm, you think? They never said it's a worm. They never said it's a snake. Yeah, I'm just curious why it's one. And you can make up your mind. There's apparently somewhere in Syria, uh, around the time of the Babylonians, there's a vase with the a snake on a stick. Uh -huh. It's the earliest depiction of the caduceus that has been found, and that's back in, that's uh, pretty far back. It predates the uh, Egyptians. All right. I'm just looking here. Which goes back about 5,000 years. Caduceus versus the staff of Asclepius. Wow. Uh, es Asclepius, that's right. M many medical organizations use a symbol of a short rod entwined by two snakes, right. topped by a pair of wings. Right. Which is the magic wand of the Greek god Hermes. Right. Here, this is the staff of Asclepius, the one with one. Yes. Professional and patient-centered organizations. That's right. Use the correct and traditional symbol of medicine, the staff of Asclepius, with a single serpent encircling a staff, classically a rough-hewn, knotty tree limb. Asclepius, an ancient Greek physician defied, deified as the god of medicine, is traditionally depicted as a bearded man wearing a robe. So that's him, and he has his staff. And this is actually the correct one, but everyone uses the double one. I guess you could use either one. You could. So there you go, Dixon. Well, I just I just purchased a book on this subject. Interesting. Personification uh, of medical healing. Yeah. I'll have to put that link in the show notes. Yeah. Cool. I've learned a lot today, Dixon. But Perhaps again, it's also the reason why things are referred to as the staff of life. Perhaps. <clears throat> so you can get healing from this. I have a few emails to answer. Would you hey, like to do that? Sure. First one is from Cam. He writes, Dick de Pommier is often talking about the importance of ecology when understanding parasitism. Does he have any suggestions for good introductory texts, texts to the subject for someone of my lowly level? <laughs> Ah, there are no such things as lowly levels if you can use a computer. So uh, that's a it's a great question though because I have several suggestions. There are two. Uh, one is out of print, but I think you can get it as a used copy by Odom. O D U M Eugene Odom. He was a professor of ecology at the University of Georgia for many years and uh, became the probably the most the the widest read best-known ecologist of his time mm -hmm. and wrote a book called uh, Ecology, The Link Between Science and Society. 
Okay. The bridge between science and society. It's a great introductory text that kind of takes social pro problems, problems, excuse mm -hmm. me, and uh, traces them back to ecological situations and how you can solve them through cooperation. Uh, there's another version of this book called Fundamentals of Ecology, which is also a great book. It's an older book. It's available as a used book on Barnes and Noble and, uh, and right. uh, eBay and places like that. And then there are much more deep. He wants a beginning one. Yeah, those are those are great beginnings. Odom is the best idea I can. All right. Have. So he continues. I recently came across this article, and he sends a link to something called uh, "What Design Can Do." For urban farming, oh. a concept for urban urban agriculture, it's a book, I guess. Oh no, it's for different places. I, I don't know what this means because this is in, all in a different language. Lectures, videos, articles, and then there's a oh, wow. anyway. He says it led him to the concept of Ugst, O O G S T, which is um, something in. It's in Dutch, the greenhouse village. You see this? You know all about that? <laughs> well, not all about it, but I've heard a lot about some of these projects. And uh, the latest one, by the way, Vince, it's very exciting that the Swedes have uh, announced that they're building a 17-floor vertical farm. Not too far. <coughs> this is in the Netherlands, this one. Yeah. So he says here, <coughs> Pardon me. Um, has Professor de Palmier come across this, and how does he view it in relation to the idea of vertical farming? you know anything about this Ugst? Every one of these ideas advances the concept yeah. because eventually people will want to see how these things work. Mm -hmm. And when they do, they'll build them. And when they build them, they will tinker with them and, and get them to work. So where did you say one a 17-story one is being built in Norway? No, Sweden. Sweden. Don't mistake those two countries. I don't mistake other, them. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> the Swedes and Norwegians are not the best of friends. I just saw a movie that takes place in Sweden. Yeah. This one's in Linkoping. Linkoping? Linkoping. It's in southern Sweden next to Gottingen. All right. We will put links to these. The next one is from Raihan. Hello, guys. Sorry, but I want to share a non-parasite-related news story with you guys. Came across this article about how the government in Singapore is deciding to invest in rooftop gardens here as a measure of controlling the recent cases of flash flooding. When I read it, I was reminded of Dr. de Pommier's brainchild, The Vertical Farm. I guess this is not exactly a farm, but it has a lot in common and displays another way of how incorporating fauna in cities can help solve problems in an urban setting. So he sends a link here. Right. Uh, cheap and quick green roofs. Great ideas. And I should also mention, by the way, the here government go. of Singapore. This is a post in Eco Business and <laughs> rooftop rain gardens here. Right. Uh, they've already built a vertical farm in Singapore now, and they've announced it. If you go to YouTube, you can, if you type out Singapore vertical farm on YouTube, you can see one of the uh, city managers describing their vertical farm. Singapore vertical farm YouTube. I heard you telling that to someone on the phone the other day. Yep. You guys may choose to read this email on your vertical farming podcast instead of TWIP. That should be coming pretty <laughs> soon, right? Cheeky grin. Now, Dixon doesn't want to do a vertical farm. Yeah, yeah, he would like to do a vertical. You would like to do a... I would. A urban urban agriculture. agriculture. Yeah, which is a broader-based... Uh, the equipment's here, man. Let's do it. Anytime you want to do it, hey, let's do I'll it. help you out. Let's do this thing. I shouldn't be involved, though. I'll record it for you because no, I can, don't know anything no, about No, 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 Vince. You know a lot about it now. Come on. We've been talking about this a long time. Well, I'm happy to do it. It's up to you, Dixon. Cause You've read man. the book. You even published a review of it. So you, you know as much as I no, do. No, I don't know as much as you, but I'm willing to help you. <coughs> All right. The next one is from Matt. Dear Dixon and Vincent. Not sure if I sent... Oh, okay. He sent it to the right place. Thanks for your wonderful series of podcasts. I have been working my way through all of TWIP, and you are currently keeping me sane whilst I data enter several hundred, several thousand clinical records Oof. from a malaria prevalence survey. Oh, wow. Uh, Matt is working in Tanzania. He's a field site project manager. Or Tanzania. <laughs> Tanzania, sorry. That's right. I also have TWIV on CDs, which I listen to in my car on my commute route to my workplace in Muheza, northeast Tanzania. Cool. And I'm very excited by TWIM, which I will indulge in soon. I am a medical entomologist currently wow. working on insecticide-treated materials against malaria vectors. Cool. And have a question, which I hope you'll discuss on TWIP. 
in relation to malaria, but also in a broader context. Right. It is this. Do you think we already have enough tools to control many infectious diseases and that funding should be channeled into improved application slash delivery of those tools and away from the search for novel techniques and blue sky research? For malaria... We already have a diverse arsenal of proven weapons and auxiliary tools, including bed nets, indoor residual spraying, intermittent preventative treatment, house screening, rapid diagnostic tests, GPS and mobile phone systems have vastly improved surveillance. We have subsidized and highly effective frontline drugs for treatment, amazing repellents and lures for mosquitoes, etc., etc. People like Fred Soper and Malcolm Watson were incredibly mm-hmm. successful at reducing malaria 60-plus years ago with a much more limited arsenal. You might say that there was much less resistance to insecticides and anti-malarial drugs in those days, but in recent times, two brilliant weapons emerged that are still being used, to which there was no resistance, pyrethroid insecticides and artemisin-based combination therapies, ACTs. What do you think are the major stumbling blocks in infectious <laughs> disease control? Is the health sector too slow to act on research findings? Thanks, and keep up the good work. Well, this strikes to the heart of a problem that I've also been talking about in my entire career here as a public health person, and that is that there are some very simple, straightforward, easy to implement, and expensive as hell programs. Note the last part, expensive Mm -hmm. as hell. And it's infrastructure for sanitation. Vince, the biggest detractor of human health throughout the world is sanitation, the lack of yeah. good sanitation. So with good sanitation, you can prevent rather than having to cure or vaccinate against many diseases. And you and I know that even though we're big advocates for vaccines and everything else, the best way to keep people from becoming infected with something is to keep that something away from them to begin with. When you can't do it because it's airborne or because it's vector-borne, then you need to institute several other measures to protect them. But if it's waterborne or foodborne, those are easily prevented. Easily meaning we know what to do, but it's expensive as hell to institute it and to maintain it. You need stable governments. You need social acceptance. You need political will. When you add all those things together, you can divide the world up into just those two places, right? Good sanitation, poor sanitation, high GP, <laughs> low GPT. It's just incredible how it breaks out. And, and, and it's also true for the infant mortality rates. It's true for the birth rates. The higher the infant mortality rates, the higher the birth rates. That's counterintuitive, but that's the way it goes. The lower the infant mortality rates, the lower the birth rates. So if you want to prevent the next 3 billion people from coming, make those people that don't have any money richer allow them to institute public health programs that we already take advantage of. We pay a lot of taxes for them. We maintain them. We take advantage of them. We appreciate them. That doesn't exist in many other places. And this guy in Tanzania knows about this too because you go into the rural parts of of less developed countries and you see appalling conditions and you wonder where should you start. I think everything starts with clean water and clean food. So if you can institute those two things without having any other major expenses, you can at least improve the length of time that people stay in school. Once you do that, because there are schools there, it's not that there are no schools. The schools don't function well because the students keep dropping out because they're sick. So I know it's from other things too, upper respiratory infections and viral diseases and malaria. Those are the three biggies that keep kids out of school in in, uh, the tropics. So to, to address them one by one requires... Commitment, commitment, commitment. And uh, every time that's been true, uh, things have gotten better. So I, I, I reflect this view quite a bit. Do you think we should not spend money on a malaria vaccine and I put it into? That. No, I'm just asking you. What do you think? That's what he wants to know. I, I'm not the right person to ask that question. We had David Fittick on here. I asked him. You know, ask the well, experts asked in malaria. Him, I asked him if, if anti-malarials could cure, could eradicate. He said, yeah, he thought so. Well, if you can eradicate, that would be great. You know, if you could have a a massive program like they did for the eradication of smallpox, that's why he mentioned uh, Soper and uh, also other people. Mm. They were involved in other programs as well. We've only eradicated one thing. All right, we've reduced greatly other things, 
But notice how hard it'll be to get rid of these last 10,000 cases. They're all pocketed in these high yeah, intense sure, sure. Uh, conflicted areas. And so that's going to be true for this as well, I'm afraid to say. And I, I'm, I know this gentleman is perfectly aware of the rise in sleeping sickness in those areas too as a result of civil conflict. So everywhere you look, you've got, you've got to juggle what's going on socially with what you know how to do in a public health measure. He's right, all the tools are there. If they're employed properly and if they're maintained properly, they should work, yeah. and they do every time. So it's frustrating. It's like a doctor that gives you a drug and you don't take it. Yeah, Compliance, yeah. it's just compliance, right? So I'll pass this on to Dr. Fittick. So yeah, that would be great. And Dr. Gwads too, because he's involved in a malaria vaccine program. But he also, that, Dr. Gwads? Yeah, yeah, no, no, he knows a lot about control programs also. All right, I'll pass them on and see what their comments are. Excellent. One more uh, comment from Dr. Kirby. Okay. He says, I thought you might like to know that my two dogs are named after you. <laughs> so he sent a photo of his two dogs. What's, there you go. What is his dog's name? Vincent and Dixon. <laughs> I don't know if he's being serious. What do you think? I don't know, but if they answer to the call. <laughs> okay, it looks like Tanz Tanzania. Tanzania. There's a thatched hut back there. Oh, yeah. I don't know. But uh, I, I, can't, I don't believe it. I just no, don't. no, no, no. Come on. We should have the dogs on the show. Why would anyone name the dogs after us? Uh, you know, people do strange things. You know, you're, you're the one. Dixon is lying there doing nothing. I'm of the one who's looking alert. <laughs> well, you should never disturb a lying dog. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt, for that. Ah, that's great. I'm honored to be. Uh, of course. I would be honored, too, if it's true. But I don't know. a dog named after me. Gee whiz. Vincent and Dixon. Two dogs, Vincent and Dixon. Hey. Cool. All right, we'll read one more from Heather. Dear Doctors R and D. Research and development. I never thought of that. I'm, I'm Vincent, not R. <laughs> That's okay. I love your podcast. It is wonderful to no, it's, listen. It's Rack and Yellow and De Pommier. You're so smart. Yeah, you're right. Rack and Yellow. R and D, it's good though. Very good. I like it. I, it is wonderful to listen to Commuting to Work. <laughs> and while I am working as the support technician for the chemistry and microbiology teaching labs at our small state college, my favorite thing about your show is that the format is similar to the seminar or journal club courses that were my favorite in graduate school. That was back when I, too, wanted to be a doctor, before I became a lapsed microscope jockey. <laughs> maybe I will go back to grad school, maybe, someday. Sure. Basically, these one-two credit courses consisted of grad students getting together with a professor to pick apart papers in specific disciplines, mm. such as microbiology. We went over the old, elegant research that was the foundation of modern microbiology. Microbial genetics, we, were, we called that one cloning club. Current topics <laughs> in molecular biology, current topics in elasmo branch biology, and current topics in shellfish aquaculture. Wow. My background is in fish and shellfish pathology, specifically the microbial oh, wow. and parasitic and molecular aspects thereof, diseases of cultured fish and shellfish. Nice. Bearing that in mind, while I realize that you focus your podcasts on human slash public health issues related to parasitism, might you consider doing an episode about epizootic parasites or microbes or viruses that impact humans economically and or ecologically. Some examples that come to mind are my good friends QPX, Quahog Parasite Unknown, or Perkinsus Marinus in the New England shell fishery, bumper car disease in Long Island Sound lobsters, or the recent controversy surrounding the ISAV, infectious salmon anemia virus yes. outbreaks in the Pacific Northwest. Sure. Then, of course, there are always parasites that are just fun for their gross factor, like salmon poisoning disease. <laughs> Regardless if your decision regarding the discussion of parasitism of non-human animals, I will continue to look forward to your TWIV, TWIP, and TWIM podcasts. Hey, we can do one on whirling disease. We can do some of these, sure. She knows what that is. Whirling? I whirling. don't know what it is. Whirling. It's a disease. It's a protozoan disease that infects rainbow trout. Cool. But it was brought from Europe to the United States by fish hatcheries. I will uh, put some of these on our list of things to do. Okay. Excellent. Sure. P.S. I read Parasite Rex as a freshman in college, and it is still one of my favorite books. P.P.S. Monsters Inside Me Sometimes Grosses Me Out, and that is saying a lot for its accuracy. <laughs> 
What do you think of that? I like it. All right. You know, we have more, but I think we need to stop. I, I agree with you. Because I have to go to a faculty meeting. The old clock on the wall says it's time to stop. Time to stop. If you enjoy TWIP, <laughs> please go over to iTunes and leave a review. If you haven't done before, that helps uh, new d- listeners to discover us because it keeps us on the front page of the Science and Medicine podcast directory. Uh, If you do use iTunes, subscribe, and you can get every episode as they are released. You can also find an app over at microbeworld.org, which you can use to stream the episodes to your iPhone or Android device. We love to answer your questions and read your comments. Send them to twip at twiv.tv. Dr. Dave Pommier, where can people find you? Well, several places, actually. Uh, In about an hour, they can find me at the Oyster Bar down in uh, Grand Central Station. (laughs) (laughs) But on the uh, Internet, they can find me at trichinella.org, at medicalecology.org, or at verticalfarm.com. Are you going to eat oysters? I haven't decided yet. Can you get sick from eating raw oysters? Possible. What would you get? You'd get salmon. You would get cholera. A form of cholera, Vibrio, mm-hmm. uh, vibrio uh, vulnic, vulnificus, vulnificus. Would you get a parasite from an oyster? No. You could get hepatitis, though, from oysters, you could right? Get hepatitis. They're filter feeders, right? They are. And if they're grown they in are. contaminated waters with fecal material, that's. You know what they do nowadays? They actually keep them in um, uh, protected water bins mm-hmm. and they feed them um, cornmeal. And the cornmeal actually cleans out their gut tract. Cool. And then they serve them. But, Excellent. But you're right. You can catch a vulnificus. I believe the name is a Vibrio vulnificus. vulnificus. Well, yeah. enjoy your oysters. And hemolyticus. Or you that's eat. another one. I got that down in New Orleans once, by the way, by eating raw oysters. Yeah. So You have it's... to take the oyster and put it in a shot of vodka. <laughs> it's called Oysters Rockefeller, You I do think? that? No, no, that's different. Oysters Rockefeller is cooked, so that's oh, perfectly that's safe. a name for where you put the oyster in the shot of vodka. I saw someone do that once. A depth <laughs> charge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.